Uh, thanks, George. Uh, just so I can uh, say hello to folks, uh, I'm not going to keep it on for a while, but I wanted to uh, uh, show the video as well. And let's see. So there I am, um, the establishment shot for presence, and now I'm going to take that off just so that we don't have to look at that all the time. So um, before I go any further, uh, I'm just curious uh, how many people might have uh, already seen the little five-minute video demo of our UMBC's uh, Check My Activity. If you could, I'm going to uh, enable a little poll, um, just a yes-no poll. Uh, it's next to uh, the hand raise if you uh, mouse over next to it and we'll just be willing to kind of share um, what you're if you've seen that video, that would be helpful for me. Um, if not, no problems. Uh, that'll help me gauge uh, kind of where to pitch this as well. So um, let's see. And uh, okay. And just so I get a little practice here, uh, publish our responses, and that's where we're at. Um, that's fine, and I, I've got some still images here that we can we can take a look at. If there's time at the end, uh, we can maybe put collaborate through its uh, paces and go through um, a, an application sharing. I've got the check my activity up, and as well as some of the the Blackboard Analytics reports, if we want to look at that as well. So we'll, we'll see how it goes uh, as well. But thank you for uh, letting me know about this. Um, so uh, I want to be real clear that um, thank you, George, for the opportunity. And I'm, I'm enjoying the class. I, I've never had taken a MOOC, so I'm glad this is my first one. And uh, I'm for the for the brief glimpse at what we're doing. I just want to be real clear. This is an approach. It is not the approach. It's just something that we have been working on, and uh, we're continuing to to work on it. It's a work in progress, and so uh, we present it for the community's benefit. And just know that you know we're we're interested in feedback and kind of. Uh, where we might be going with this as well. So what I want to talk about a little bit is uh, something that I've observed uh, uh, in looking at the kind of how the analytics community is evolving. One of the things I keep finding is that the number five shows up a lot. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that in this next slide. So uh, some of you may have uh, seen what Educause had written about sort of the various five stages of analytics. Uh, Phil Goldstein had written about this for uh, an Educause Center for Applied Research. Um, and what I, what I thought we could do is maybe just take a quick poll amongst ourselves. So give me a second here. And what I'm going to do is, uh, there we go, and we're going to make responses visible. Where do you see yourself or your institution on this list? And uh, what I'm going to uh, do is suggest that you know if you see at the very beginning stages of ex just extraction and reporting, get, getting your hands on the data, uh, where do, you know where do you see yourself? Uh, analysis and monitoring, what if scenarios, predictive modeling and simulation, or automatic triggers and alerts. So. Um, if you could take a moment to just tell me where you see yourselves at this point, and if you're having problems with that, let me know. So again, you'll, we'll be using the poll that we just did, um, and you can um, you can select one of these. What would be the best choice for you and your institution at this point? Uh, and we'll we'll unpack what these things mean in a second, but I, I just thought this might be useful to uh, to see here as well. Cue the Jeopardy music here. Okay. Um, give you one more chance to select an option. If you're not sure what an option is, that what these entail, that's fine. We'll we'll go through these a, a little bit later. Um, but. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just uh, end the poll now. And so here's where we're at as a group. Um, would you like to see where uh, the field was um, back in 2009, four years after this uh, poll was, was uh, first put together? 
So uh, not surprisingly, you know, a lot of us are still sort of in these early stages of really just trying to grapple with what I would call the infrastructure of analytics, which is both technical uh, hardware and software, but also expertise. Uh, just trying to get the right people together is, is a challenge as well. So uh, not surprisingly, uh, two, four years after this uh, was created, I'm going to just delete this poll here. Um, Four years after this report, uh, Yanowski, uh, again for ECAR, uh, did what I would call uh, a, repeat, a repeat of the five stages of analytics to see where people were at. And as you can see, um, a lot of people, a lot of institutions were still at these early stages. Um, I was a little disappointed in ECAR's recent study, and again, you can see that it, this is this number five that keeps showing up uh, all the time. I was a little disappointed that ECAR changed its measures um, for the, the 2012 report instead of focusing on kind of where we were along those five stages, which could have been an interesting longitudinal um, observation. They, we changed it to focus on sort of you know, the maturity or the things that go into um, um, doing analytics. I, I would not disagree at all with any of these things in terms of the, that they're important to progress along analytics, but it, it was always helpful for me to kind of benchmark where are we as a field, where is higher ed going with these kinds of things. If you want to, I encourage you to take a look at the, the full report uh, at the URL below. But um, Notice again that even though the measures changed, we kept the number five. The, the best five analytics stages that I have come across is from Purdue. Um, this, to me, is the simplest to, to understand in terms of kind of the, you know, kind of the cyclical stage. And I, I recall, George, your, your own presentation uh, last week about um, there were more than five elements, but it still had that kind of um, come full circle, uh, the kinds of things where they feed into each other. But you know, if you these these kind of map very nicely to the five stages of analytics that Goldstein and Yanowski looked at. You know, gather is stage one in terms of just getting your uh, your hands on the data. Um, the predict might be the analysis stage where you're trying to uh, kind of draw some insight. Um, the, I think the third stage of acting. On these is is probably the most important because this is where you're 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 making um, educated guesses and you're trying to act on. I would argue that uh, analysis is not analytics. Uh, analytics is um, analysis with action or the actionable intelligence. But then using that to monitor what you have observed and then refining that and working it its its way back in there. Um, so I, I've always liked this. I thought Purdue does a does a good job with sort of the sort of framing. Uh, of analytics, and I, I like how they, they do this. With that said, I want to be real clear. I am only going to focus from this point forward on the intervention or the action, because my own personal um, beef with analytics right now is that I want to see I want to see us taking more risks at putting the analysis into action, because I think the field needs that. Um, I do not pre presume to think that what we are doing is is 100% uh, correct, but um, we're trying and we learn when we see what other people are trying to do as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to just focus on what we do uh, with uh, how we have looked at intervention and try to focus on that. So uh, with that in mind, uh, this is a view of our um, uh, check my activity that students see when they log into Blackboard. Now this is our campus portal, MyUMBC. It's a custom uh, portal. Uh, it's uh, Ruby on Rails for those that are interested on the technical uh, side. Um, and we bring our, our course level links into the portal so that when students are in the portal, uh, this is the first thing they see is what we call the uh, check my activity dashboard. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this other than to say that what we present to students is a view of how active they are in the course based on hits. And yes, I mean hits. Any click, access, you know, um, anything that they touch inside, we count it. Um, we average it uh, compare, and we compare it to the average of the course. Now on the right-hand side, if the instructor um, posts grades in the gradebook, then the students on this under this gradebook column, uh, let me see if I can just kind of point that out here. So uh, under this gradebook column, if the instructor posts grades, then students can see how 
their activity compares with students who earned the same higher or lower grade for any assignment. Um, and you know, many of them do. Uh, in in more detail on on the check my activity, we we define what people can do here. Uh, we we do uh, some surveying from people, and we also make a disclaimer that their activity uh, is being tracked um, based under our assumptions of um, how we can help people under FERPA. Uh, my one little comment on um, uh, FERPA is that often it is portrayed as something that we uh, we have to p protect in terms of student data, and I, c I completely agree with that. But the purposes of FERPA, from my perspective, is to free administrators up to try to, who have an educational interest, to try to improve uh, the educational effectiveness of the institution for current or future students. So the, the one thing I would like to see is um, uh, people be a little bit more um, uh, forward in the view of FERPA because I think it's it's meant to help us, not to hinder us. Uh, that's my my own little take. So with that in mind, you know, students can see what they're doing, uh, how they compare with peers. Um, why might they want to do this? Uh, this is an older slide from some previous data, but what we have found is that over the last uh, since fall 2007, students who earn a D or an F tend to use our Blackboard learning management system about 40% less than students earning a C or higher. Um, the graph kind of shows you the green are the DNF uh, uh, users, the, the red is A, B, and C, and the blue is the courses. Um, you'll notice that the blue is obscured by the other, uh, the, these two uh, charts here because we just didn't have enough courses. Uh, at the time we were dealing with a very small sample. I was a little bit reluctant to, um, to be you know, talking about this, but in 2010 we started using iStrategy, which is the company that Blackboard bought and has now become Blackboard Analytics. So we were looking at all courses and found that the same sort of pattern held true is that about 40% um, students who are earned a D or an F used it about 40% less than students earning a C or higher. Um, now that we're using Blackboard Analytics, I'm starting to see similar kinds of things. Um, this can be a little challenging, but let me just kind of walk you through this. So from left to right, uh, the blue, yellow, orange, and green bars for every column are the quartiles of activity. So uh, in the blue bar for um, the A users, um, these are the people who are the most active um, that also earned A's. And then the green bars are the people who were least active but still earned A's. And as you can see here, even the least active A users and B users and even C users were much more active than D. Now, F, you know, maybe a little less of a difference, but if you aggregate the two, you're still, you know, coming with much less activity. Um, this was sort of helpful for me because, you know, I, I started to using a different method other than our own um, uh, proprietary method of seeing the same data. Uh, as other schools have started to use Blackboard Analytics for Learn, uh, I have also been hearing from them that they're seeing the same sort of what I would call stair-stepped, you know, method of, um, you know, activity by by grade distribution. So, you know, this was this was helpful for me when I was first going through it. Um, and then, let me see what else here. So this is relatively new, and I'll, I'll tell you what, before I get into this, um, George, I noticed in some of yours that you've taken a moment to uh, take questions. I'm, I'm wondering if it might be useful to do so now, um, or if there's anything in the chat space that we want to look at, or shall I just go ahead and proceed? Okay, so I, I'm going to go ahead. Um, so this is relatively new, and let me try to explain what this is. And uh, so we, we've talked a little bit about the Blackboard Check My Activity. So every, every year for the last 20 plus years, at midterm of every semester, our Learning Resources Center sends out an alert or, or, or canvases the faculty and asks them, if the semester were to end tomorrow, who would be in jeopardy of earning a D or an F? 
Uh, we call this our first year intervention alert. It um, is um, sent to all freshmen in transfers. And um, historically, over the last 20 years, we have found that students who get an alert, uh, about 40 to 50 percent of them go on to get a, a C or higher. But the one thing that we've never done is that we've never asked the students, after you got your alert, what did you do? And so this is the, uh, this is, these are the series of sort of help-seeking behaviors that accompany the, the uh, student alert that, that students get. And what was interesting to me was that um, the Check My Activity was the third highest tied with uh, a visit to the Learning Resources Center for uh, working um, with tu tutors. Uh, after, you know, second rank was discussing with the instructor and the number one rank was uh, seeking academic advising. The other thing I would, I would point out, uh, although we haven't done it every semester, in spring 2011, we found that students, in, in using binary lo uh, logistic regression, we found that students who used the Check My Activity after accounting for all other variables were nearly twice as likely to earn a C or higher as students who had not used it as all. I would say at this point we are still just starting to get our hands around some uh, significant uh, testing, uh, but the prob but the p-value on this was 0.006, um, which is uh, pretty good in terms of you know the the odds that this would be occurring by uh, by chance. So uh, now, now I will tell you that this response. Um, we we had we sent this to 1,100 students uh, who got an FYI alert in the fall. Uh, the response rate was low. It was only 130 that completed. So not quite you know just over not quite 12 percent. So I, I don't want to try to push this any further. But I just I would I would say that in terms of usage, the check my activity is getting used a lot. Uh, I see this. Um, kind of um, report, especially when it goes down, we get kind of lit up with uh, tickets for support. Um, we're still trying to understand what does it mean to um, work with students on, on, on the Check My Activity, giving them feedback. So here's the problem that I've got. Um, I, I would say at this point I cannot make a prediction. I've got correlation, which is not the same as causation. But I can't make a definitive prediction yet. I, I have uh, the correlation uh, that we have been doing has been on population data, not sample data. And for those of you who are statistically inclined, you know that that's uh, that's a that's an important thing a distinction because if we're not just sampling the data, we're looking at all courses, all students, and you know the the findings about the DNF students not being as active as seen above. This has been consistent for several semesters now, over five years of data. So. Um, but at the same time, I haven't had all of my hands on all of the data that I need to do to do the statistical uh, significance testing. The other problem is this key one that I want to point out here. Not all students use the LMS the same way, but neither do their faculty in their courses. So how do you predict and then how do you intervene? These are some of the challenges that I think we're facing uh, in terms of uh, sort of dealing with two variables at a time. One is how the students are using the LMS, and the other is how the faculty are. And that's what I want to get into here for a little bit. <laughs> so with that in mind, I want to introduce you to Tim Hardy, who is a professor of uh, Econ 122, um, which is your, our basic accounting course. He has been the most active Blackboard instructor. His course, uh, Econ 122, has been the most active Blackboard uh, course uh, since 2010, um, except for once in 2012 when uh, he was second. But uh, he's always been uh, miles ahead of everyone else. What's interesting about what Tim does, he uses a tool uh, that we, t we showed him back in spring 2009 when he attended our hybrid course workshop. We showed a tool to him called uh, Adaptive Release, which some of you may be familiar with if you use Blackboard. In a nutshell, what Blackboard does uh, is it allows, uh, Adaptive Release allows an instructor to set preconditions that students must meet before they can access any other content. So for example, what Tim started doing was he <coughs> Um, would require a quiz over the syllabus so that uh, students would have to take and pass a quiz over the syllabus before they could turn in the first assignment for credit. 
Uh, he also, as an accountant, had very particular ways that he wanted students to use Excel pivot tables. And he got tired of answering the same questions over and over and over again about how he wanted them to use Excel pivot tables. So he would create a little short three minute, two to three minute screencast video. The students were required to watch it and then take a quiz on the video of the Excel pivot table skills that it demonstrates and that the assignment assesses their ability to do. So as you might as you might expect, he ended up doing his entire course using adaptive release, which for me is a form of adaptive learning, which I am starting to see more uh, show up in the analytics, which I completely agree with. I think this is where course design is really uh, uh, starting to be more interesting. Um, so it's an interesting tool, and what what he found is that his activity absolutely shot through the roof. Now he also told me um, the students hate it. It's an unforgiving taskmaster, but he doesn't care because it works. And the evidence that it works is that um, in accounting, there is a common final exam for this course that all students must pass in order to pass the course. And Tim's students are scoring 20% higher on the common final exam compared to other sections uh, of the same course, Econ 122. Now, what, what's, what's interesting is I, I was talking to our president, Freeman Radowski, uh, not just about this, but about uh, student success in general. And he made a comment that was interesting to me. He said, student success is not passing one course, but it's passing the next course that requires the first course. And I thought that was really interesting. So I took a look at Tim's next uh, course. And, and, and here's our, our president in the, the, the quote that I, I, I had mentioned. So I took a look at the course that Tim's Econ 122 course is a prerequisite for. Now I know there's a lot of information in here, so, so bear with me. I'll try to walk you through it. This Econ 301 course, um, uh, cost accounting, basic accounting is the requirement. In Tim's courses, and, it, and I'm giving you sort of the spring 2010 as kind of the dividing line, the green bar is, bef is Tim's course the average in 301 for students who took his Econ 122 course. And this is before he started doing adaptive learning. After he did adaptive learning, the course uh, uh, average in the next course, again 301, rose to 3.37. So that's interesting in its own right. But what's interesting to me is that, you know, again, even before he started doing um, uh, the adaptive learning, Tim had a slightly higher course average compared to other sections. The, the red is uh, other um, uh, Econ 122 students who did not have Hardy before spring 2010. The blue bar here, uh, these were transfer students who had not had Econ 122 but went ahead and took the course anyway. But if you look at the comparison between, you know, the gap between um, um, what was before um, Tim's use of uh, adaptive learning in spring 2010. It's a much higher gap in this after he had started to use it. So even though he had a higher course average of his students in the next course, um, after he used adaptive learning, the gap almost doubles. Um, now, Granted, these are very small sample sizes, and we are not able to do the uh, significance testing at this point. But we've been following this in every semester since spring 2010. This is basically held true. So essentially, Tim's students are earning better than a half letter grade higher in the next course compared to students from other sections of Econ 122. Um, <clears throat> so what does this all mean? So uh, you know, we we threw. Looking at Tim, we had kind of found adaptive release as being a significant course activity or design activity. One of the things we started to notice then is that looking at how many uh, the items that were accessed by courses that use adaptive release rules versus non. So what we were starting to find was that um, you know in in courses where adaptive release rules are engaged, the students tend to access that content more than in courses where adaptive release rules are not engaged. 
Um, this we found interesting as well. Um, and so what we started to do is we looked at our most active courses and started to, to try to find out what, what kinds of tools are they using. Um, what we ended up doing is we found we, we had a panel this last uh, fall. If you want, you can go to this URL uh, after the presentation, hopefully after the presentation, um, where we had a panel of faculty who had been using adaptive release largely because we've been promoting it for a, a long time. And lo and behold, these are courses, many of which are undergraduate courses that um, are showing up in the top 50 of all courses in terms of activity. And the, uh, again, the rankings of uh, courses are based on average hits per user in the course. The reason we do this is that uh, this is a, an, a more equitable way to, to look at adoption of the LMS across uh, different uh, enrollment courses. So a, a small enrollment course can have a high average student activity in the LMS, thus being ranked higher than maybe a large enrollment course where Blackboard's not being used much at all. Anyway, we had a good turnout for this presentation. It also led us to a very interesting uh, innovation that uh, one of our chemical engineering professors did. Basically, basically he used adaptive learning to do I'm sorry, to Johnny, just to pull your mic, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else is having the issue, but there's a lot of background or a lot of uh, uh, break up happening. So I, maybe if we just uh, try connecting again, I'm not sure if there's something disconnected or moved or otherwise, but uh, let's turn the mic back over to you and see if uh, see if it works any better this time. How's this? Uh, still having some echo problems? Um, still having problems, okay. Um, I'm, I apologize for that. I don't know what it might be on my end. Um, George, should I try to come back in and get out and come back in? Okay, I will, it's better now. Testing one, two, three, testing, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Are we okay? Okay, uh, I, will, I will proceed and feel free, George, to uh, interrupt me again if that continues, okay? So uh, it's basically this use of uh, adaptive learning, um, uh, Josh Enzer, who is the professor, uh, was able to create what he would call sort of achievements or levels up. In, rather than students losing points uh, as the semester progressed, he used adaptive release to give them feedback on when they uh, had you know, say turned in all of their assignments. They would get certain points or what he would call achievements. Some might call them badges. But this presentation is about the, the, the impact that his game-based approach to Blackboard had on student attitudes and engagement. It was a very interesting presentation. It's a little screencast. It's about 10 or 12 minutes long. You might want to take a look at that. But uh, it was an interesting approach of, of using adaptive learning that I thought was, was useful. Uh, I'm going to proceed to the next slide. Hopefully, uh, we're OK uh, on the sound here. And I'm going to press along a little bit just to kind of make up for some time. So e essentially, one of the things that we have been finding is that how, people, how faculty use the LMS is a variable that we have to look at in trying to predict how students will succeed based on their own use of the LMS. And it sort of makes sense if you think about it. But um, what we're finding is that basic user and document management is kind of used by most people. Uh, as you kind of go uh, up and down the, 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 the hierarchy, people are using communications. That's you know, fewer people are using that. But these assessments, in, including adaptive release, using the grade book, practice quizzes and, and assignments um, are the least used. And so in terms of an intervention, um, that's one of the things we're trying to do is promote more to faculty how they could be using this themselves. And in, in this is a kind of a startling example of what this looks like. This is a list of all of our courses by discipline for spring 2012 in terms of activity in the, uh, in the LMS. Now, it is not an exhaustive list here on the right of all our courses, but these color bars are. The, the page went another uh, couple of pages. But you can see right now that when faculty use the Grade Center, um, the activity that's associated with it is much higher. It isn't that it's a cause and effect. It's that there are related activities assignments that generate a gradebook entry 
that make it more um, uh, useful for the students, and uh, they are also more. In, I would argue, and this might be the debatable point. I would argue that they're more engaged in the course when they're more active. Some this is the one point of contention that some have had with what our approach is, and I and I understand it, but I I choose to take it, take that that position. Um, so. The other ways that we're starting to use Blackboard Analytics is to try to identify how courses are being delivered and how they're designed and then what the net effect is. Um, this is um, you know, a, a graph for all of academic year last year showing face-to-face uh, -face courses uh, would be here, hybrid courses, online. As you might expect, online tends to have more activity than hybrid and, and so forth. But what's interesting is looking at um, whether or not a, a, a faculty member has gone through um, our alternate delivery program, that's what this ADP stands for, which is essentially our approach to helping uh, faculty learn how to use uh, online learning tools, design the course, uh, principally to help students take more responsibility for their own learning. Now the next graph is a little bit challenging, and I'll, I'll try to get through this as quickly as I can, but essentially this is um, looking at uh, all face-to-face -face courses uh, in each of the first two left bars. So blue is face-to-face -face, uh, all courses, and then the next one is face-to-face -face trained. And then these are the various measures in terms of content, uh, course accesses, or average minutes in access. E essentially what you start to find is that um, the, the courses that have gone through some form of training or some form of course design or focusing with the, the faculty member, they tend to have higher activity uh, in terms of student uh, activity measures. Um, and then just, you know, as you try to look at it in terms of the kinds of tools that they're using, again, uh, in terms of content, people who have been trained tend to use it more than those that don't. Uh, the, the one thing that's a little different, and we've only done this for this last year, so I'm, we need to look at this more. There isn't a huge difference in the percent of content that is accessed. Um, now, that's content. That doesn't necessarily mean, mean you know, the interactive tools, which you start to see here. It's a little bit higher, but you'll notice the, that the grade center is much higher. And not surprisingly, the assessments are much higher. Um, the ECAR study of undergraduates in IT for years has identified that students value checking grades and practice quizzes and exams as the most valued functions in an LMS by far. Uh, so it's not surprising that these kinds of things um, you know, are, are much more uh, valued by students. Um, <clears throat> so a, a question just to try to, as we, as we gear into wrapping up on this, how can we nudge improvement in LMS users? And I'm going to be deliberate here and say that I'm not just looking at students, because I believe there's sort of a symbiotic relationship between students and instructors in the LMS. I think that one influences the other if we'll show them the data about how they relate to each other and how they relate to peers in particular. So with that in mind, I'm you know, kind of hearkening back to some things that I know that George has talked about. You know, there's, there's analytics everywhere now. If you go onto Amazon and you buy a book, you know, you'll get a recommendation based on what somebody else uh, bought. But um, you know, as you look at sort of uh, different ways that people could be using analytics, I have a friend who has a, a CGM, a continual glucose monitoring device that's implanted. What was interesting when he, when he told me about this is that when his glucose goes to a certain level, the alarm triggers. And that's a, that's a good alert. But in terms of self-regulating, what he ended up finding is that by his diet and exercise, he could keep the alarm from going off. Well, that's the, that's the epitome of the kinds of change in behavior, motivation, and awareness that we're trying to look at. A couple other ex examples that come to mind, I don't know how many of you use um, uh, 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 mint.com so you can see what the price of gas is in your neighborhood or across the you know across the country or in the state um, this is an interesting example uh, o power is an electric utility that was trying to help people um, conserve energy and what they ended up doing was showing how their own uh, you can't quite see it but right here it says you uh, how your own consumption compared to your neighbors and what they found is that this simple thing um, changed people's consumption. Now, the, the downside was is that if your consumption was lower, 
and I don't think you really see one, and the neighbors were higher, you tended to you start using more uh, energy. So it had sort of a, a downside effect as, as well. But we use each other to kind of gauge, um, you know, how we're doing things. And and I know George had one of the readings uh, for this week uh, was looking at nudge analytics, and they reference the work of Thaler and Sunstein. Um, in this, this work, which has been really informative to me, they talk about something called recap. Uh, in this case, they were talking about um, how consumers could be aided in the choice of credit cards based on credit card rates and, and, and terms and policies. And what they talked about with recap was it just, you know, record, you know, the data of, of what um, users do, let them evaluate it, and then most importantly, let them compare with what um, their peers might be doing, and then look at alternate prices. In other words, you might have uh, conditions set up where you see a, a list or a table of credit card rates in terms of percentages, you know, uh, grace periods, you know, what the interest rate or what the um, penalties were, and then you let people run their own data through it, and then you do sort of a comparison like what you might do you know, with uh, Mint.com or Opower or things like that, and that people, if they're given better choice tools, they will make better choices. And that's the whole point of Nudge is, you know, this idea of choice architecture. What are the kind of environments that we create in the LMS, in any kind of technology, any kind of tool? How do we allow people to see how they compare with others? And then the question I would raise here is, you know, if you were to replace the word price with performance, you know, maybe performance might be activity. I don't know that I'm ready to say, you know, definitively grades or final grades because I know people want more than just those final measures um, and, and maybe even more direct measures. Um, but, um, you know, you could do this on a variety of ways for both students and instructors. You know, maybe instructors, it's course evaluations, maybe it's activity. But if you let them see it and give them the dashboard to do it, and if you give the opportunity for people to compare themselves with others, more often than not they will. And, and they'll learn something in a more scalable way than I could ever do to try to intrusively advise uh, with them. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the premise behind this. I've been influenced by the work of Barry Zimmerman at the City University of New York that's been, who's been working with remedial education in both math and English. And one of the things that Zimmerman and others talk about is that if you give people a chance to observe how they distinguish or how they see themselves as different than others, they will observe that. They will try to emulate this. They will then try to practice and as practice becomes perfect, they become self-regulated in their learning. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go into this in more to you, detail, but I highly recommend taking a look at uh, the work of Zimmerman. Um, to kind of give you an idea of what this is look, looking like as well, uh, this graph, let's say we use the analogy of tying your shoes. Um, when you're a little kid, you don't know that you need to tie your shoes. It isn't until maybe a, an older sibling or a friend tells you and says, uh, you can't tie your shoes, that you become conscious that you don't know something. You, at this stage, are incompetent and you are conscious. You know that you don't know how to tie your shoes. Well, now you start to watch or emulate the person who does. You become competent but it is by no means unconscious. You have to maybe painstakingly tie your shoes. You have to have little mnemonic devices of the rabbit going around the hole or whatever it is. But at a certain stage, you become unconsciously competent at tying your shoes. This is similar to the blind spot of expertise that is sometimes discussed with instructors. They don't know what it's like to not know what they know. And as they're teaching uh, students, sometimes students can learn more from peers initially than they can from the expert, which is sort of counterintuitive, but we've seen it, it manifest itself in, in similar ways. Um, so going forward, one of the things that we're wanting to do with our Check My Activity is maybe give people um, the ability to see not only how active they are in the course, but how active is the course overall compared to other courses. Could we give users an opt-in alert to uh, alert them when their activity is falling be below a desired GPA or grade? 
Uh, do we want to let people share monitoring rights with someone else, maybe an advisor, maybe a friend, uh, so that you know you could you could use some of these social uh, aspects that would that might engage somebody. You know, when I first was thinking about this, I, I had never even heard of RunKeeper, but now you know you can put your run in, you can see how long it took you to go a certain distance, and then other people chime in. I think people are gravitating towards these things because we use each other as sort of social norming, whether we should or not. Uh, for, for all behaviors, uh, but it is happening, and I'm wondering how we can leverage that. And then, of course, we're trying to improve the, the graphical display of the things that we're working with. So these are you know, a couple of things that we're working on right now. You've seen our check my activity, but uh, we felt that it is sometimes more like a wall of numbers. What we want to try to do is um, maybe give people a better visual sense of these kinds of things. So these might be uh, activity in a course by GPA. Since not all since not all faculty use the gradebook, what's a consistent or a persistent context of a student's activity that we could give to them? So you know maybe being able to compare by GPA would be a useful uh, way to look at it. We're also uh, looking at how we could then show students in their course. Here's how active the course is, and here's your rank in that course. You know, in some ways, if students could see that you know a course is either more or less active than other courses, that might regulate their own engagement with the course. If they're highly active in a course that isn't, maybe they don't read too much into it. On the other hand, if they're not active in a course that is overall, maybe that becomes more of a, 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 a nudge or a push as well. These are just prototypes. We haven't actually implemented these. I'm a little concerned about this one because it starts to get down to individuals in terms of GPA. Uh, that would be a complicated thing to do in a small enrollment course, and so I think we're kind of moving away from it. But you're getting the idea of the kinds of things that we're wanting to, to look at. And then these are some of the uh, reports that are delivered now with Blackboard Analytics for Learn. Um, uh, we started out just by looking at hits uh, in a course. Uh, now we're starting to look at some of the other measures, you know, course accesses, minutes or duration, and then interactions, you know, could be uh, page views or assignment submissions. But this might be something that could be useful for a faculty member. Now, Barbara Shoecraft is a phony faculty member, but, you know, if you can see kind of what her activity is, you know, through here, and then uh, what the department average is, that may or may not in, encourage uh, Barbara to seek out her colleagues, and if we provide the list of the uh, activity rankings for other courses, they could do the same. Uh, similarly, you know, here's something that uh, instructors have access to, and again, this is all phony data. But uh, it's a little complicated here, but it's a combination of looking at grade and activity. So in, in essence, it's a heat map uh, by interactions over the term, where you can then see how, uh, you know, is somebody active in a course, but they're getting uh, a lower grade? Uh, are they active in getting a higher grade? The ones that I think you want to look at would be something like this, where they're trying, you know, they're, they're being active, but maybe they're a lower grade. Well, an, an instructor could kind of then look at, say, uh, someone like, um, I would say, this person right here, Jeff, uh, Jesse Aleph, and, and kind of see, you know, she's trying, but not quite getting there. And then, of course, as the term ends, she becomes inactive, and it starts to get that lower grade. I think as we have these kinds of tools, they could help uh, complement the sort of natural instincts that certain people have. But what I'm wanting to do is make sure that the users themselves have the context themselves. Now, this is an instructor report, but I've suggested to Blackboard if you if you um, if you anonymize the names of all the students here and simply showed the student you are here, this could be a really useful report for the student as well. Uh, so. Um, you know, these are some of the things that you know we've been we've been looking at. Um, we've been fortunate to work on a subgrant uh, with Purdue in the Gardner Institute for uh, Excellence in Undergraduate Education. We're looking at uh, sort of a suite of student feedback tools. I haven't talked about it, this Quiz Zero and Math, but um, it's essentially an initial diagnostics of the rigor of a math course that students have placed into, so that they can see what it's going to be like. Uh, through the semester, but uh, we'll be talking about this uh, a little bit more in April. And I'm going to stop at that point because I think I've covered uh, way too much here and take any questions. Thanks, John, for that uh, great overview and uh, certainly nice to see the ways in which you've progressed in the planning and the deployment of, of the uh, 
of the analytics initiatives and what I find particularly encouraging about it is you know the trajectory of you know with analytics in particular you have to start somewhere even if it's not perfect uh, but you have to begin somewhere so that you can begin to get some reactions and some feedback from your system and uh, I know in, in the past when you uh, talked about check my uh, course activity and looked at what you're doing there and it's easy, it's easy when you're at early stage of an initiative to receive comments or suggestions for improvement but to see you know where you started with that dealing with sort of a limited number of metrics and getting some feedback to students on how they were doing and to where you are now where you've got a greater amount of feedback you're starting to be able to splice that feedback uh, in more more um, you know, reflective of the context of the individual student and so on. So I think a big lesson I take away from, from the presentation is having watched your analytics work develop over the last three years is just the importance of starting with whatever you have, even if it's not quite perfect at any stage, even if you're dealing with limited amount of data, even if you perhaps don't have quite the right technical expertise in your organization yet, begin somewhere because by doing that you'll start to get some additional feedback and input which then in turn will capture the attention of uh, university leaders once they start to see the actual numbers coming in. Yeah, so anyway, that was that was uh, great to see you detail where, where you folks are at now. Can you give us a bit of an indication of where you are going forward, what you'd like to see happen next with the system? Um, well, we have sort of transitioned. Uh, first of all, are you, can you hear me okay? I, I turned my mic off so that you could talk. Um, are we okay? Okay. Um, I, I would say right now um, we're still in the transition of cutting over from our homegrown analytics uh, to Blackboard Analytics for Learn. And some may question, you know, why are we doing that? Uh, it, it's really sort of a pragmatic one. Um, we just didn't have the resources to take this any further. Uh, it's been useful working with them, and I also, largely because of what you said, George, I, I want to see what other schools are doing. By no means do I think the LMS alone is where we should be working on analytics, but because most schools have one, it's a place to start that I think, or at least I hope, will create some value that then create some investment in looking at all the other tools too. I would love to see uh, sort of integrated analysis of Twitter, Facebook, whatever the things are in terms of how people are using in a course so that we can sort of have the bake off, if you will, of you know what's best that is not driven solely by the user interface but of the user experience and also the user behavior and activity and as we correlate those kinds of things. So uh, we're continuing down the road working with uh, uh, analytics for Learn. Um, where I would like to go is get a little easier access to all of the data elements so that I can build the model out and try to get to that prediction. So for example, one of the things that we've been talking about here is as we start to, and I kind of mentioned some of them here, but as we start to look at the different feed, suite of feedback tools that we are assembling for students as an environment, if we are reasonably persuaded that these can be useful indicators to students, then early on in the semester, if they're not using any of them, that then might complement our intrusive advising approach. I don't want to see anything like this kind of, I don't want it to take away that, you know, that, that there's not an important role for advising or instructors. It may be that there's a, there's a, a, a sort of environment of what people can do that we have to be able to help them with. So I, I, I still need to build out the infrastructure a little bit more to get what I would call at the predictive elements. I had a hunch. I followed it up. We've monitored it. We've looked at some of the data. But I'd like to be able to do uh, a little bit, uh, little bit more rigorous, thorough uh, vetting of the entire process. Um, just taking a look at a few of the questions. So, is there an easy? Is there any comparison between different instructional or learning objects between Hardy's Econ 122 and other sections? And is that kind of thing trackable in the LMS? Uh, that's a very good question, John. And that's part of the the deeper infrastructure that I want to be able to look at. The other thing that I haven't added here is I would like to be able to take our course evaluation data and add that as a dimension or. Uh, measure that we add to not just the students' final grades, but also their activities. But what we, the one thing I would say is that um, we did find that high active, highly active courses used the adaptive release tool more than those that did not. So that's something that, um, you know, we're going to want to 
want to keep following uh, a little more closely there. Um, but these, this, this kind of nimbleness of being able to drill down a little bit more deeper, we have it there, but sometimes uh, we don't have all the dots connected, uh, and, and that's what I, I need to do. It's in the, in the warehouse, but not necessarily fully integrated. Um, there's a question from Rosa. Sorry for me. It's easy to implement this tools in Blackboard. Um, Rosa, that's a challenging question. If by easy in terms of install it and plug and play, I would say not necessarily because what you still need is somebody to care about the analysis to ask the questions. And that's probably the biggest thing that I have seen is that it's not going to be out of the box. I mean, I have, as George knows, because I've you know, been engaged with this dialogue for a couple of years now, it takes a while. And we've been doing it for a long time, just as he has and others. And we need to you know, keep working at it. And unless you have somebody who's willing to kind of keep looking at that question, try to answer it, and then iterate and refine, I don't think the tools themselves are going to give the insight but the, you can't have the insight unless somebody's engaging with the tools. Ludmilla, um, so the question from Ludmilla is to uh, build into Blackboard designed by your team. My college is very small. Students, we are not able to support an analytics team of our own. Um, I hear you, and and I I do recognize this. I, this is where I think the open source community that George is leading is really helpful because I think there are a, a lot of tools. I I don't know that I would say they're free in terms of effort or expertise, and that's where I think schools have got to kind of make some of their choices. But uh, the readings or, or George's opening announcement this week was work with the data that you do have, and try to get as much insight and value out of that to warrant a deeper investment from your stakeholders, uh, whatever stage that is at. Because that's how we, we I started doing this with a grad assistant. And um, you know, we were trying to look at you know, how to ask, answer the question of adoption amongst large and, and small enrollment courses. So it, it has been completely iterative, and it's taken me a long time. Um, but it, once you get on the scent or you get on the hunt of a of a of a good question, it, it does it does I find it very rewarding. <clears throat> How did you design the student friendly version of the data presentation interface? Uh, I have to give all credit to Collier Jones, who is our campus portal architect, just an amazing, amazing person who has a just a gifted talent for both user interface design, technical architecture. Uh, he's really done a wonderful thing there because initially I completely I have to tell you it was not student friendly. And I was uh, since, since we started using the campus for the adoption of the type of theories and why you I don't know So John I had to cut you off again there. Uh, not sure what it is, but uh, your audio suddenly started to to uh, echo again and then turned, uh, uh, well, somewhat impossible to understand what you're saying. So uh, I killed it. Maybe we can try again and see if uh, if we get some audio, uh, better audio this time. We're almost out of time. So if it doesn't work, that's, that's fine. We can just end on that note. But let's just see if you have concluding thoughts. Um, concluding thoughts on sound. Any better? Any worse? Um, I think on that note, we ought to end it, George. So I have nothing more to add. And, and uh, thank you for the opportunity and the time to, to work with you all on this. Great. Well, again, John, thanks very much. Uh, as I mentioned, it's great seeing uh, sort of the way that your program is developing, the way that you're starting to add sort of more nuanced approaches to uh, providing student feedback. I particularly found the emphasis on students being able to see their own data rewarding. I mean, it just makes sense. We see it in all aspects of our daily lives. It's rewarding to have feedback on on uh, what you're doing, the activities you're involved in, and that uh, it just makes sense that we include that in our learning activities. It's certainly a prominent way that folks with social media interact with each other, being able to track and see how they're doing in relation to others. So just giving students even rudimentary feedback on their own activity, sometimes in comparison with others, other times uh, not, but just giving that feedback can be quite a motivating layer. So on that note, I'm going to end the recording. Thanks again, John. Really appreciate the presentation, and I'll have the recording posted later in the day.